Welcome, everybody. My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Uh, thrilled to welcome you back to the virtual ring group. We are continuing, almost done. This is uh, to read the Hannah Arendt's book or lecture series, Lectures on Kant's Political Philosophy, edited by Ronald Biner. Um, uh, we are nearing the end. Uh, today, we discuss uh, lectures 10 and 11. Um, and next week, we'll discuss the last, I think it's next week. Um, I'm not sure if we're meeting for Passover next week or not. Someone can maybe check and, and let me know. Um, but next session, we will read sections, uh, lectures 12 and 13, which are the last two um, uh, lectures in this lecture series. We will then read um, the essay, uh, Imagination, um, which uh, is reprinted here, uh, although there's another version of it um, also in um, Thinking Without Bannisters, the book we read recently. And then um, we'll conclude with a discussion uh, with Sheila Ben-Abib about uh, Arendt's thinking about judgment. So um, we're coming to the end, a lot of um, good things coming up. Uh, we, um, I'm just trying to admit people as they come in, I don't have anyone helping me today, so I apologize. Uh, I will continue to do that. Um, where are we at? Um, so, you know, again, this book is, is an attempt uh, by Arendt to uh, provide a, th a thinking about political judgment. Uh, how do we judge uh, in politics, how do we judge something um, good or bad, right or wrong? Um, and she, in order to raise that question and pursue that question, uh, she turns to Kant's aesthetic philosophy and to uh, specifically his thinking about aesthetic judgment. Um, and, and that's what we are uh, exploring in, in this book. Um, right now, we are in the series of uh, middle uh, lectures in the lectures course, in which she's really um, posing very directly the question of in political judgment, in political questions, um, who matters more, the judge or the actor? Who matters more? Uh, in determining the meaning of the war in Ukraine, the, the people fighting the war or the people uh, judging it, the spectators. Um, and, and the argument uh, she is going to make is that there's this clash between two principles, the principle by which you act and the principle by which you judge. And... Um, Kant is going to argue that in this clash, um, the judge, the spectator, is of more importance both aesthetically and Arendt is going to argue also politically. Um, now, of course, one thing that's important for us to say, first of all, anyone who acts is also a judge, right? That's that's an important point. It's one that's not always emphasized enough. If I go to fight in a war, I'm an actor, but I also can't but think about how it'll look. How will people judge me? Right. And so just as I'm an actor, I'm also, as part of myself, a spectator of the acts. Also, if I'm a spectator, and I judge the war in Ukraine. And if I talk to people about it, in some say I'm an actor. I'm acting in the world. I'm having an impact in the world. I'm, I, I'm joining together with others who share my judgment and, um, and, and, and making it and articulating it. And that, that judgment will impact the world. And other people then can judge my judgment. Um, and so... I, all I want to say at the first point of this in this clash between judging and acting is that it's not 
it's not an absolute separation. All judges are actors, all actors are judges. Um, and, and, and we have to, we should always be aware of, of that. Um, in the ninth session, which we read last week, um, she says that the spectator, because he's not involved, he's disinterested in a way, he withdraws, he's outside of um, the action. Um, the spectator then can perceive a kind of story, the design of providence or nature or progress, which is hidden from the actor. When an actor is engaged in a war or in a, in a conflict, they're often too close to it to sort of step back and look at it um, as the spectator or the artist or the judger can. And thus, she says, the spectator gives all authentic meaning to the action. Um, and this is true in war as well as in philosophy, as well as in art. Um, but who is the spectator judging? Who is the spectator looking at? Um, and in that sense, of course, the spectator looking at the war in Ukraine is looking at the actors, the war in Ukraine, the people fighting. And yet RN says, not really, because what the spectator is doing is taking a disinterested look from afar. And in doing so, the spectator looks at the, at the war uh, and asks, what does the war tell us about human humanity, the human species? The war is about freedom. The war is about uh, authoritarianism. The war is about uh, nationalism. The war is about um, families and violence. And when we look at it from that point of view, the actors sort of fade away, the individual actors. Um, and the judge, the spectator, um, tells a story about humanity. And in this sense, she says it is the judge not the actor who gives hope to the human species. Um, because we can look at these events and tell a story that we narrate that says we're moving forward, we're moving towards some, some end goal. And, and the two things we generally move forward to in Kant um, are uh, freedom, that we ever become more free, and free to, to act, and also uh, a kind of cosmopolitan world peace. And so the spectator, the Kantian spectator of world history is telling the story of, 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 of world peace. Um, in lecture 10, which is the first one we read for today, she says that the spectacle, the spectacle uh, that is seen by the spectator is mankind, the human species, projected into infinity. And thus um, the spectacle that we see is a spectacle of perpetual progress. Um, insofar as the spectator inserts a kind of progress mythology uh, into all spectatorship and judging of the world, um, they're guided, she, she says for Kant by the ideas of reason um, and towards, as I said, freedom and peace. These are the ideas that allow the story of human history to make sense. Otherwise, it would be utterly depressing, chaotic, and we would, in a sense, turn away from the story with disinterest and uh, let things go to go to pot. Um, so, uh, the spectator who tells the story of infinite progress, who is he or she or they? Um, and usually, she, RN says, the spectator is thought of in the singular. It's one person looking at and judging an event. It's someone who withdraws from the event and can witness the event. And this contemplation is a kind of solitary business. It can be carried out on in solitude. Um, and she gives the example of the cave from Plato's Republic, where um, all the people who are chained and looking at the reflections on the wall uh, are, can't talk to each other. They're solitary, um, but, they, but they have no, no sight at all. All they can see is the shadows. 
but it's the one who turns around um, uh, and can and can and can in a solitary way see the light, the sun, uh, as the source of the shadows. Um, who can then tell a story as a spectator? But unlike spectatorship in in solitude, action is of course acting in concert. It's not in solitude. Um, and so that the political way of life, and this is now what she's really starting to bring up in chapter 10, is that the political way of life is opposed to the um, spectatorial, philosophical, or contemplative way of life. Um, and that there's a conflict between one who acts and one who knows. Um, and she then... And this, this conflict between one who acts and one who knows is also often understood as a conflict between uh, practice, one who acts, and theory, one who knows. Um, and she then raises the question of, again, who has precedence? The, the, think, the theorist, the one who, theory, again, in the sense of um, uh, seeing, one who sees and speculates, watches or one who acts and she says the spectator has precedence here i'm going to be combining lectures 10 and 11 because they're 11 is really in a sense a, a deepening and repetition of lecture 10 they had a they had a vacation she comes back and it's largely a repeat of lecture 10 but with i think um in a more clear way so i'll be now taking you through the the main arguments of lectures 10 and 11. The first argument is that in this distinction, there's a distinction between the spectator and the actor, between theory and practice. The second, I think, main point of these two lectures is that the spectator has precedence over the actor. So she says that what makes the French Revolution a world event is not the French Revolution, not the deeds, not the actors, uh, not their misdeeds even, um, but the opinions and enthusiastic approbation of spectators. So, you know, you know that story of Kant toasting to the revolution. It's the people who watch the revolution and see it as a moment of the uh, introduction of freedom and, um, and democracy into the world that make the revolution uh, a world event, not the people who acted in it. She says the spectators are uninvolved in the event, although every actor is also a spectator, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and the spectators are in the plural, not simply the singular. They are involved with another, with one another. Uh, unlike the spectators in Plato's caves who are chained and can't talk to each other or see each other, the rest of us are part of can can you know I can read the New York Times and the and the Wall Street Journal and I can read all these different things and I can watch the news and I can talk to people and we can jointly collectively um, begin to talk and uh, make judgments, which is why again just like the actor has a spectator in him or her, the spectator has an actor in her. Um, and so at this point she says and this is now the big move in the book, you know, drum roll, please, right? Um, in order to understand what these spectators do and why their judgments are political and so important, she turns to Kant's book, The Critique of Judgment. And we pursue now an analogy between, on the one hand, the artist and maker and genius, um, uh, to the audience. So there's the artist maker genius who makes things and there's the audience who witnesses the art. And similarly, there's the actor who does things and there's the spectators who witness the act. And she says, Kant asks in the Critique of Judgment, who is more noble, right? The, the, the artist or the, uh, the person who watches and judges the art. And she quotes Cicero, who says, everyone can judge, but few can make. Um, judgment is thus by a silent sense. And so you might think, 
um that since acting and making are the property of the few and judgment is the property of the many that acting and making would be more noble but that's not uh Kant's conclusion or or her conclusion um uh the point for her and for Kant is that it's actually judgment which everybody is capable of which is a property of everybody uh which is more noble and more important um the mental and then she now says all right well what do we mean by judgment what does Kant mean by judgment well um judgment is now understood on the analogy of taste. And taste is one of the five senses, right? There's what taste, sight, sound, smell, and touch. And Kant distinguishes um, sight, feel, and touch as the objective senses, in the sense that when you see something, you see something. When you feel something you feel something and when you um hear something i mean and you uh, and you hear something you hear it and you can sort of reproduce that i can if i see you on if i you know if i see uh you know um neil on the screen and i go away i can sort of reproduce a picture right but if i and the same with feel a sound if i hear thunder I can say it sounds like boom, you know, boom or whatever. I can make an approximation of it. But if I taste something, how do I tell people how it tasted? Right? It, it, it's not. I mean, it's not easy. I can't. I can't reproduce that that sensation. Um, and so, taste and smell, which she says are things we can't do that for are the private senses, whereas sight, uh, feel, and sound are the objective senses. Um, and the private senses cannot be represented, represented. They cannot be represented in the world and in my, in my mind. Th this takes us to the next uh, point that she makes, which is that taste becomes the vehicle for judgment only because or because only smell and taste are discriminatory by their very nature this is a point kant makes we taste what an orange and we savor the sweetness we taste burned toast and we're repelled by it each taste is particular and unique and it 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 it, it it's not like and we, we, we have this taste, we feel it in some way, but we can't, re, you know, we can't say what burn is, what burn taste tastes like. We just know it's bad. Um, it's, um, and she says this, it pleases me or displeases me is immediate and overwhelming. And so these private senses are subjective, they're inner senses, and I am directly affected. Um, there's no dispute. You know, how, if I say this is awful, oh, terrible, I can't, ugh, you can't tell me I'm wrong, right? It's, it's an, in, it's a, uh, you can't, you can't dispute taste. There's no argument you can give me um, to say, oh, no, actually, I think that burned crap you're eating is really good. Um, uh, taste is on the one hand, non-communicable, it's private, and it, on the other hand, it's not disputable. And so the question then is, well, why should this kind of private, non-communicative, non-persuasive taste uh, be the model for judgment. Why do we talk about judgment as a matter of taste? Um, and her, that's the question she asks. And the answer she gives is that it's based on imagination. Actually, two things, imagination and reflection. We're going to focus on imagination today. Next session, we'll talk more about reflection. Um, but imagination is the ability to make present what is absent. Imagination is what transforms the objects of objective sense, transforms the objects of objective sense into sensed objects. 
It represents them by the operation of reflection. Um, by the way, that's on, it's in the Critique of Pure Reason on, in, on page 294 in Kant pages in section 40. Um, and and, and, and the, this is the, these are some of the essential 39, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, up to 45 are sort of the essential sections here of the Critique of Judgment. But in, this, in these sections on the imagination, um, what Kant says is that the imagination represents and dematerializes the objects, even in objective sense, so in seeing, so that they become internalized or private. That is beautiful, which pleases in the mere act of judging it, Kant says in section 45 of the Critique of Judgment. What pleases is perception. In perception is gratifying, not beautiful. But in judgment, what pleases is not simply gratifying, it's beautiful. We can actually, when I say it pleases me, the artwork pleases me, the dance pleases me, the music pleases me, as a judgment, I'm not saying it makes me feel good. I'm saying it conforms with certain understandings of the way the world should be. Um, and it, in pleasing in imagination, my judgment conforms with the laws of understanding, and that is what makes it beautiful. So beauty for Kant is not just a kind of mere feeling. It's a feeling that is in conformity with what is right and lawful. Um, and, and so the imagination takes this subjective sense and in a sense universalizes it. It allows me to make present what is absent and reflect on it. And in reflecting on it, say it either pleases me as in conformity with what is right or displeases me as in conformity with what is wrong. So that when I view a painting or a work of art, whatever that work of art is, I'm judging it subjectively, but subjectively within this feeling of its conformity with the understanding of right and wrong. And that is um, gonna open up what she calls the operation of reflection. Kant calls the operation of reflection. Um, and this to do this, to have this kind of judgment, you have to be detached or uninvolved you can't be caught up in, you can't be a friend of the artist and you can't be uh, um, a, a partisan of the French Revolution. Um, the spectator has to reflect on the representation of the revolution or the representation of the artwork. And then she can judge it right or wrong, beautiful or ugly, good or bad, or in between. And it's by means of this representation, this imagination, this pulling ourselves away from the thing, that we distance ourselves from the object and we become disinterested. And taste, because it's already a private, um, uh, um, because taste is already private and not connected to the, to the, to the object, um, for, for Arendt and for Kant is a model for judgment because it's, it's, it's already based in this representation, this disinterestedness, this pulling away from the objective thing judged. Um, and that by pulling away from it and removing ourselves from the object, we established what she calls the conditions for impartiality. Um, all of this uh, leads to the idea that um, there is something uh, um, non-subjective in our private reflections of taste, right? That even though it's a private reflection of taste and it's in the subject and it is subjective, um, there's something non-subjective. And what is that? Where does that non-subjective come from? Where does, it, where does it come from when we talk about that what's beautiful is what conforms with laws of right and wrong? Um, and, and section 41, uh, and Arendt quotes it here at the end of, 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 of lecture 11, Kant says that the beautiful interests us only when we are in society. There's no sense of beauty if we are alone on an island 
and not feeling with others. Um, and he says, we are ashamed if our taste does not agree with others. In matters of taste, we must renounce ourselves in favor of others. In taste, egoism is overcome. The argument here is that there is a kind of common sense, um, a sensus communis, that there is in our judgments of taste uh, something non-subjective, uh, 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 that somehow when we make such judgments, we are not simply imposing our um, egoistic subjective view, but we are um, asking whether the, the, the representation judged, the imagination judged, conforms with um, some kind of common interest, not self-interest. This is part of the disinterestedness. Um, and I always judge as a member of a community, as she says uh, near the end on page 67, end of, of, of lecture 11. And so this is um, where she's headed now is to develop this idea of judgment as a disinterested, impartial, detached, reflective judgment, not based in the object itself, um, not even based in an individual, but in a kind of, um, uh, uh, as a member of a community, which is going to be the grounds for what she is going to call political judgment um, on the analogy of, of taste. Okay, um, that's maybe where I should stop today. And uh, let's see where we can uh, go. Is uh, I just, is the chat not open? Hmm. Um, is there a problem with the chat? Yes, yes. there's a problem with the, the chat. the chat so we can message everyone? I have no idea. Uh, participant can chat with everyone. All right, there we go. I apologize for that, folks. I don't know how that happened. Uh, has that fixed the problem? Okay. So there's two ways to participate. You can engage in the chat, which I now have uh, opened up and I apologize for that, uh, that mistake. I don't know what happened. Uh, you can also raise your hand by clicking on the little reactions button on the bottom of your screen and clicking on raise hand. Um, look forward to the discussion. Chat's on, go ahead, be civil, be nice. I just got out of a workshop I was working in all day today on academic freedom and how to encourage difficult conversations. So I'm ready for it. Um, uh, good, who's first? James, go ahead. Unmute, James. James. You there? Thank you. Thank you for your order, sir. Hold on, I am I? Trouble finding my little, my little, uh, Arrow. Uh, Roger, you can imagine I love this, um, these two chapters, all the, the senses, the uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the art, et cetera, et cetera. But she, at the end, she comes to this, hence we may be tempted to conclude that the faculty of judgment is wrongly derived from this sense the sense of taste, right? Um, On page 68? Right. Yeah. So this law is self-evident and compelling by itself. The basic other directness of judgment and taste seems to stand in the greatest possible opposition to the very nature, the absolutely idiosyncratic nature of the sense itself. Hence, we may be tempted to conclude that the fact of the judgment is wrongly derived from the sense. Tempted, but obviously don't give in to temptation. Um, Kant, being um, very aware of all the implications of this derivation, remains convinced that it is the correct one. Does she? Is she convinced that it's the correct one? 
Yeah, I think so. Wow. Okay. I mean, she, the whole the whole premise here is, I mean, is that she thinks that um, uh, political judgment is does originate in in taste, like Kant. Um, okay, I'll take that and run back to my hole. I think. I mean, unless unless I'm not understanding your question. Um, but no, you, you're understanding it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Neil. Um, so to connect back to thinking when, when Iran is talking about, so like in the case of a war, you can be an actor in the war and a spectator. Um, that is like the two voices within us that she was speaking about in thinking, correct? I mean, that we, we are, our inner life is a dialogue inside us. Because um, she talks about how when we do that, there's also a moment when we're speaking or acting where it's not a dialogue anymore, we're focused. And I was thinking about um, in the case of, like when I was in Iraq 10 years ago, I could think about the war like between missions, but as soon as I climbed on a Black Hawk and you know, strapped in my seatbelts, I wasn't reflecting anymore. I was only acting. You know, yeah. I needed to be doing what I was doing. So is that what you were trying to, is that what she was saying or? So uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, and so a, a few things to, to keep in mind. One is, um, when she talks about the two in one, which is what you're referring to, Neil, and I think helpfully, um, she's talking about thinking, right? The two of one is a dialogue that goes in thinking. And if we go back to the life of the mind, which many of us have read right before this, you know, she wants to distinguish thinking, willing, and judging as three oh, different right. faculties of the mind. Um, so, uh, um, um, in thinking, yes, uh, we have to let our mind go wandering. I'm just going to mute people so I get a, they'll get a feedback. Um, let our mind go wandering, and we need to um, talk to ourselves as if we would talk to others. So earlier in this, in, this, in this book, on the Kant lectures, she talks about how um, uh, there is no free speech really without free thinking um, and free thing and no free thinking without free speech because you have to be able to talk to people. The, the principle of publicness is that you have to test your ideas against other people. Now, he, one of the questions this raises, and I think it's one of the more thorny problems in our end scholarship or our end reading is what's the relation between thinking and judging, right? Um, both thinking, thinking requires the two in one. Judging requires publicness. It requires that I test my theories against other people or even myself. Um, in, in, and both thinking and judging are qualities of the mind and thus withdrawn from the world. They're both disinterested. And so in all these ways, it seems like thinking and judging are quite similar. Um, they, they have a lot to uh, to unite them. Um, the, the difference, uh, as far as I understand it, and again, I, I think this is a, this is a difficult issue sometimes to understand in her work, is that, um, thinking is, is not necessarily political, and it's not necessarily in any way, um, engaged, uh, uh, it, with particulars, it can, you know, I can think about anything. I can think about the ocean. I can think about Arendt. I can think about um, the painting. But I don't have to put my thoughts into the world. And I don't have to judge a particular uh, thing. I can just think about it. Whereas judging is actually making uh, a claim about good or bad, beautiful or ugly, 
that I claim other people must agree with me on. And thus judgment inserts me into the political world, inserts me into the common world in a way that thinking need not. Thinking can really be fully, as she says, useless um, and uh, with no effects in the world. But judgment has to have effects in the world because in judgment, I put myself into the world. Um, the one exception for thinking when it does have an effect in the world is if, if everyone else is acting unthinkingly and I stop and I, in a sense, think and I don't go along with them, simply by thinking, I make them aware of my questioning of what they're doing and I act in the world. Um, but that's the only place where she says thinking really matters in the world, um, whereas judging does matter. Um, I think that's should be make sense. Um, but if not, happy to elaborate. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Uh, great. Ken. Uh, that's that's great. I think this kind of follows that. Um, one of the things I was thinking about that she wrote was that the Germans who didn't become Nazis didn't consider it. They just couldn't do it. It really came from what you're talking about in her description that it was a matter of taste. It was like a repulsion and that they, it wasn't like, should I become, should I go send people to the concentration camp? Should I not? They just couldn't do it. And it wasn't a thinking process she was talking about. And that's one thing that I was thinking about. And the other is that I think the word that's being translated is pleases, displeases, is, is, is it lust, unlust from the German? Is that right? I know. I think it's Valgefallen. Okay. Uh, I, I could be wrong. I don't have. Uh, well, there was there was one place where she wrote lust, unlust in parentheses, and I thought that was interesting because it seems like also that there's a compulsion there to taste that's stronger than pleasing or displeasing. It's you know like almost erotic. Right. And on that, on those lines, I think I also want I separate. My understanding separates taste and judgment a little further than you were doing, Roger. That, that um, there, I I think the what you were talking about was following Kant's view of judgment. That there's something in it that leads to something positive. Reason or the intellect or judgment leads to something positive. But I think the way Arendt uses taste also accounts for bad taste a lot. Like it accounts for why people are voting for Trump. And also why, um, I, I, and what I wanted to discuss was something from my experience, which is that I come from the true suburbia. I come from Levittown, a few miles from Levittown, but in a black and Jewish part neighborhood that the Levitt brothers built, like really the quintessential suburbs. And we had Keen paintings. I mean, we didn't have, they probably weren't made by Keen, but we had the big eyes paintings. And so did our neighbors and probably, uh, most of my family had them too, along with like the gold paintings from traveling and stuff like that, you know, Paris. And I don't think we ever said they were beautiful. I don't think anyone really thought they were beautiful and I don't think we were necessarily judging them. I think we had them because our neighbors had them. It was like, it was the same reason I think a lot of people are voting for Trump. They don't think he's truthful or even noble, but it's aligning with a certain community. And that's the same reason we had these paintings on our walls. Um, but I also had the experience of selling the most uh, blue chip art in the world at Robert Miller Gallery for many years. And I'll tell you that the, the wealthiest people in the world were not even entering the gallery. They were sending people to buy the art for their walls there, first of all. Second, the people who did come in who were coming in to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of hundreds of thousands of dollars on artwork did, and not, did not have an established taste of their own. They were coming there because they had a certain budget they still wanted it to match their couch and to fit over their couch. And if the salesman gave them too many options, they walked out without buying anything. They were there to have decisions made for them. So it's not just part of like my community growing up in suburbia that we didn't have our own sense of taste and we were relying on others, that all the way up to those most expensive pieces of artwork, for the most part, people are relying on, they're making a gesture that fits in their community. If you don't have an, ex an Agnes Martin on your wall in Greenwich, it's social suicide. You can't do something else. 
but they don't necessarily know to go buy the Agnes Martin. They'll, they have someone else advising them on it or they, they're seeing it somewhere else. So I think that her, this is all just my way of saying that I think there's a separation for her in taste. I think those paint, the Agnes Martin is better, but that's not because of necessarily the people who are buying it. I think they're still acting out of the community, but the census communists can also go awry as which what led so many people into Nazism in the first place but also leads people to buy the Keen paintings or the Agnes Martins, but the Agnes Martins might have more judgment behind it. It might be, you know, John Chime advising someone to buy a painting is better than um, my aunt. Anyway, that's my, my separation there. <laughs> excuse me, one, Spot excuse me, one. Spot on. Yeah. Um, I, so, your 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 analysis of um, the art market, I think, is 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 well well made, uh, and and I'm sure also of the way most of us um, go through life making uh, making our decisions. Um, we might make a distinction between judgment and prejudice um uh a prejudice is a prejudgment one that's largely based on conformity and the community you live in and something you've generally accept but don't have to think about very much uh and so um a lot of what you're talking about um in your experience both in suburbia and in the art market is that we rarely uh, have the time or the effort or make the effort to make what we might call, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to use, the, to make real judgments or authentic judgments. Um, most of what we do is we make prejudice, you know, we, 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 we make habitual judgments or prejudices, prejudgments um, that are based on, um, you know, the fact that we generally trust these people and we accept their judgment and we don't think about it too much. Um, so I think you're right that that's the case. And I don't think it could really be otherwise. None of us would have time to make judgments about every, if every day walk, you know, I had to decide which potato chip brand I'm going to buy and make a real judgment on it. I wouldn't ever eat because I wouldn't have enough time. So, you know, we generally go along and follow the crowd same when, when we buy art or uh when we choose our politicians um uh so i think your 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 basic critique that um uh we we rarely make the kind of intense uh judgments that Arendt is talking about is true and kant is talking about um uh and that too often we we simply go along with the prejudices in the crowd. Um, but that I don't think uh, changes. Um, I mean, I don't think that's a challenge to the idea of what a judgment is. It's just saying that judgment is hard. It takes the kind of disinterestedness, withdrawal, impartiality, um, that Arendt and Kant are, are elaborating that very few of us have the desire or time or ability to do on a regular basis. Um, so, and I think that's true for taste as well as it is for judgment. I don't, I, I, I mean, I take your general point. I'm not sure I understood the distinction between taste and judgment, um, but, and I'm not sure what, 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 how much of a, what rides on that distinction in, in your well, mind? The, the crude distinction would be to say that um, taste doesn't necessarily rely on the beautiful. Taste that the senses communis, and it's really important that there's the way I think she's talking about taste, and also I think for her, the senses communis, that they can both get derailed. And judgment might, especially if we're looking at it through Kant, might have more reason and intellect and more thinking involved in it. And I think that's an important distinction. And it, and it also like, otherwise we're saying like, what's beautiful about Trump? 
or what's beautiful about these Keen, these Keen paintings, like it's very hard. And I don't think that the, the initial, the judgment was made with judging, as you would say, like it's not a process. And that's partly how it gets, it's, uh, you know, she's, she's not describing, it's not prescriptive at all, it's descriptive. She's describing something as it operates in the world, but not saying anything like, this is what we should do, or this is, works better or anything like that. Uh I'm not sure. Okay. I don't, I don't understand what your problem with taste is. I mean, so. Oh, it's when, not a when problem she, at all. It's when just. She said, when, when she says, I don't, I, I have to admit, Ken, I don't know the keen paintings, but I'll accept your oh, words. It's just the big eyes, like the, these awful paintings, like the eyes are really exaggerated, really big. You can think like be a cat or like a little girl crying or something like that. Like they're really cloying. Okay. I mean, to the extent somebody um says you know i think these paintings are beautiful right they're making a judgment of taste in both kant and Arendt's vocabulary um in making that judgment of taste they're not actually um they're not actually making much of a <laughs> they're not the, 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 the painting itself is important because it's the object, but the judgment of taste is less about the painting hmm. and more about the representation of the painting and its imagination within my private sense inside of me as um according with certain uh, laws of the understanding of what makes something beautiful. Um, and so uh, the census communis is that I have a sense of these laws of the understanding of what makes something beautiful. Um, and I'm claiming that these painting in uh, in some sense, uh, uh, conforms with with those laws, or and even makes me aware of those laws. Um, so yeah, I, I, I to say that Trump is right or good uh, is to say not again. It's to abstract myself from Trump. It's to privatize my judgment and say that there's something in. Um, his behavior uh, that conforms with the laws of understanding. Um, now we can say, and, 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 and to make that judgment, I have to make the judgment that everybody can see that. Yeah, I, I guess I'm gonna go one step farther, Roger, to make my point, which is that I don't think taste is reflective in what she's talking about. I think taste is, I pro, how is it a priori? It's, it's before reflection. It's before judgment. It plays into judgment in the way we're talking about it. But I think the distinction she's making would say that taste is not reflective in its nature, that judgment is and taste isn't. So that's what that's the distinction I'm trying to make. I'm sep for me to understand these readings, I have to separate taste a little farther than um, separate taste a little farther from judgment than we're doing in this conversation. And it doesn't seem, and what I was describing about how we're choosing our paintings or how people are choosing uh, their politicians uh, can involve judgment, it can involve taste, but when it's involving taste, it's before reflection and reflection doesn't come into it necessarily. It does when it becomes judgment. I mean, so I, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure now if you're trying to make an argument about what Kant and Arendt are saying, or if you're just trying to make an argument out your your own, your that's own. That's my understanding of what Arendt is saying. That's that's the only way that is I there can. A, is there a particular it. place that you find that expressed? Um, can I get back to you on that? Yes, um, I could probably find it, but not immediately. It's and it's probably not. It's not in the lectures on Kant. It's more in the Promise of Politics. Okay, well, that's a, yeah, I mean, I mean, The Promise of Politics is a different book written for, written 
20 years, 10 years earlier. Well, yep. Yeah, uh, but it's also from more from her perspective and not from Kant's perspective. Right. That's why I'm. Okay. I mean, her. yeah, no, I saw what you said about that. Um, I mean, I, I think that maybe part, I don't want to, maybe part of the issue here is that for her, she reads largely taste and judgment here as the same. Um, you know, she says even that Kant called the critique of judgment the critique of taste. Um, she's she's trying to to hold these two things together, and that taste for her is not object bound. Um, it is a private sense. It is a it is a sense of um, reflection. Um, at least in in this book now. Um, if there's a reason to to then say. In other things she writes that doesn't fit with what she's saying, that would be an interesting point. Um, uh, All right, I'll try to get back to you on that. I don't okay. want to take up everyone's time. All right, it's a good point, though. I mean, I'm happy to, to 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 talk about it. Um, so just to just to take a you know, I mean, the, the the passages where this is really discussed, Ken, just so we can have a place to look at is pages 66 through 67 and i'm just looking at it and you know top of 66 she's going to equate judgment and taste bottom of 67 she's going to say judgment and especially judgments of taste always reflects upon others and their taste so that for her taste judgments of taste are reflective um now again I'm happy to, you know, I think it's an interesting question to say, is she here sort of too caught up in Kant and in her own words, in her own thinking it would be different. Um, but I don't think so. But I'd be happy to have that conversation and learn where um, I'm miss, missing, what I'm missing. But that's how I, I mean, I, I don't think on the on the level of the text we have here, we can hold up a, a meaningful distinction in her approach between judgments and judgments of taste, political judgments and judgments of taste in the way you're talking about. Um, but um, thank you. Kant, right above that, as for common sense, and I'm still on 67, Kant was very early aware that there was something non-subjective in what seems to be the most private and subjective sense. So even in taste, there's reflection. That's another way of interpreting that sentence. This awareness is expressed as follows. There is the fact that in matters of taste, the beautiful interests us only when we are in society. A man abandoned by himself on a desert island would adorn neither his hut nor his person. Man is not contented with an object if he cannot feel satisfaction in it in common with others. Right? Um, finally, and most radically in taste, egoism is overcome. That is, we are, we, that is, we are considerate in the original meaning of the word. We must overcome our special subjective conditions for the sake of others. In other words, the non-subjective element in the non-objective senses is intersubjectivity. So all of this seems to suggest to me that for her, taste is a reflective property, a judgment. Does that make sense? Or am I, I mean, I'm trying, you know. Yeah, no, I could be wrong. What, it, what happens to me then is it doesn't separate out the people who are um, judging poorly. Well, so, so that's a whole, that's a whole nother, you know, bag of worms as they say right i mean how do we then know how do we how can we distinguish um uh good judgments from bad judgments and so just to be very clear this is the argument that people like jürgen habermas marshal against han Arendt, right and they say han Arendt's aesthetic approach to politics doesn't allow for us to say who's right and who's wrong, right? They say 
because she she has this aesthetic approach, we can't say, you know, oh, you got it wrong. You, you voted for Trump or you got it wrong. You don't like Trump. And and um, and I think in some sense, Habermas is right to say she can't say that um, because she has this aesthetic. That doesn't mean she thinks that all judgments are equally right. That's not the case. But um, but it's very hard to there's no there's no right answer to this that we can uh, objectively point to. Um, and that's why a lot of people in the Habermasian school don't like uh, this approach to, to political judgment. Um, you know, we'll be talking, you know, uh, how do you, you know, how do you make, how do you say that this painting is, if I say this painting is beautiful and you say, nah, I don't see it, how can I convince you, right? There's not really uh, an answer. Um, I can simply say, if you open your mind and seek to understand our world, you'll see it's beautiful. But that's sort of arrogant. Um, uh, and so we're left with this problem in aesthetic judgment of, of how we um, how we can uh, come to uh, uh, agreements, uh, a kind of agreement on what's right and what's wrong, what's beautiful and ugly. And um, she doesn't have a, she doesn't have a, a simple answer to that question. Well, I think in fact, she's, she's allergic to that, an answer to that question. I think she wants us to argue over it. I think that's part well, of yes, her but intention. But argue over it is, is a great point, except she doesn't think that you can argue an answer. You have to, what do you, so what do you, I mean, and this comes back to the book you're talking about, The Promise of Politics or Introduction to Politics. How do you engage with people who you think make bad judgments? If you tell them you're an idiot, you're wrong, it usually just reinforces the difference and you don't get anywhere. And that's why she says no amount of pamphlets and no amount of re-education is going to solve this problem, right? If you think people are, are racist and you say you're a racist, it's not going to help. And if you say, you know, you must not be racist, it's not going to help. Well, what is going to help? Well, she says in that essay, the, the introduction to politics, that the only way to uh, deal with this is to is politics. OK, what is politics? It's constant talking, constant talking and discussing with the hope that as you talk and discuss the two different worlds that you guys are judging from start to some find some common ground. And there may be, it's not that there's going to ever be one common ground, but you might, if the more you talk, the more common ground you find. And so it's not that one person will be proven right and the other wrong, but they'll both see that there are parts of the other person's worldview, the laws of their understanding, that may make sense. And they'll talk that. And the other guy says, oh, there's parts of your view. That and the more you talk, the more you create a common understanding and you come back to common judgments. That's, that's as I understand it, her politics. I'm not sure it's right, but that's how I understand it. Yeah, I see that differently too. Just that that the and I'm sorry this I mean I'm so I thank everybody for like letting this discussion continue so long but I see it as that sh there's a certain point she wants agreement that we're based we are looking at the same reality and then other than that we're sitting at the table with not agreeing with each other agreeing enough to take action but not agreeing finally with any of with anything but we're we can uh, then we're creating the world in our space of disagreements between us. And then in that space is where the, her world is created. It's in that space of contention and. Okay, it's in that space of contention, but she does think that there is, that the more we talk, the more we'll find places of agreement. And we'll also find places of disagreement. Her goal is not 
conformity and 100% agreement. Her goal is enough agreement to, to, to build a more rich world together. And that's what politics is. It's not to get conformity, but it's to get, you wanna build as much agreement as you can because the more agreement you have, the more rich opportunities for culture and, uh, and, and achievement we have. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I, dis I, I largely agree with, I think, what you said at the end. And I think this was an important conversation. So I'm glad we had it. I mean, I, I, it's not over. Happy to continue it. Thank you. Um, who's next? Stephen. Thank you, Roger. It, it is a very valuable conversation and well worth the time. I'm going to have to be brief. I'm expecting a visitor. So if I leave abruptly, you'll understand. But uh, in talking about Kant as a spectator, uh, you made the point that, that he makes that uh, uh, without believing in progress, the, the scene of what human beings do would be unbearably depressing. Uh, but Hannah Arendt did not believe in progress. And yet she evidently felt and advocated a love of the world. Uh, I mean, her time was not a time of progress, but rather in the present between past and future. So how did she reconcile that uh, her love of the world with her uh, refusal to believe in progress? Well, yeah, um, I think she doesn't believe in progress. Uh, and, and so, and this is where I think the, the point that Ken made at the end, which I think is really helpful is, is worthwhile. Um, part of what she loves about the world is what Ken called, I think the space of contention or something like that. Um, uh, she, she learns to love plurality. Right. I mean, if you want, I mean, I hate using buzzwords, so, you know, I try and avoid them. But if you want to put a couple buzzwords in here, plurality, natality, um, what what she learns to love about the world is that we are all different and that uh, there's something beautiful about that difference. And uh, also that there's a potential to start new things, new, start new uh, ideas, new new states, new cultures, new 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 ways of life, and um, and that that capacity to begin again um, is something extraordinary. And so, um, yeah, even if we're not going to move progressively to some cosmopolitan Kantian ideal, um, we can celebrate humanity as a, as a, as a species uh, that uh, can, can bring new and beautiful things and also horrific things into the world, but um, can constantly be able to bring new things in the world, no matter what horrific things it's brought in in the past. Um, and that uh, love of that human world uh is 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 something she can embrace uh even amidst the the horrors that it carries with it um it's not an easy it's a harder ethic than i think the progressive ethic i mean you know she's not a progressive mm -hmm. um uh but that's where she that's where she ends up thank you that's a great answer roger Thanks, Stephen. Good question. Uh, Monica, hi. Hi, thanks. I've really been, been enjoying this discussion. I think, um, yeah, I like that prolonged discussion with Ken quite a bit. Um, my question this week has to do with um, some of the things that we discussed last week in terms of this um, need to uh, expose your judgment to publicity so that you can develop an enlarged mind and an impartial viewpoint and fold that in and dispel any prejudice or error in your judgment. Um, and I'm just wondering what that might look like. It kind of gels with uh, what Ken was discussing when he says that certain people liked 
Keen paintings and other people like Agnes Martin paintings. And that seems to be um, directed by forces with more power that are wooing people to their side of the judgment, right? These are sort of prejudgments or prejudices that are existed in existence and unexamined, right? People just go along with them and don't examine them and take them for what they are. And so I'm just wondering, like, if good judgment is predicated upon this ability to expose it and remove prejudices to come up with a better judgment, where does that take place? So I'm thinking about something like Socrates, you know, in his environment, that was just a certain population that were contributing their viewpoints to render judgment. In something like the internet, which is a form of media, I think a lot of that is, um, you know, these algorithms and these big powerful corporations that control these algorithms for their own purposes tends to direct people to stay within their prejudice, right? You get sort of routed down a rabbit hole that is confirming of your initial prejudice. And so I'm wondering, like, it is a lot of work to take in and listen to impartial viewpoints and bring in that diversity that could elevate your opinion and render better judgment. So my question is like, it's a lot of work and what does it look like and where does it take place? Like, what are some of the possibilities here? <laughs> well, uh, good question. Um, it's actually it should be the question for our conference coming up in the fall on, on social media and democracy. Um, so let's start from the basics, right? Uh, Monica, I mean, Kant, uh, Arendt says that for Kant, the judging public is not the voting public, it's the reading public, right? And, you know, your, your first reaction, my first reaction on reading that was like, yeah, that's two people. What, what are we talking about? But but what she, what she means is, I think, is that the public that you submit to in the principle of policity um, is not a, a, a voting yes or no, but the, the public that is engaged in the conversation. And if that's right, which I think is a if, I think it's right, but we'll see. That brings us, I think, to a pretty comfortable place for Ara, um, which is to say that, as I said to Ken, her answer to prejudice is politics. What is politics? In the end, it's talking. And so she talks about debating societies or with a ward system that Thomas Jefferson had proposed. She talks about town hall meetings. She talks about the need to engage in conversations with people who disagree with you. Um, and so, if, if that's right, I mean, this is my reading of Han Aran, you know, I, I'm very taken by her, this line that she uses three or four times in the late 60s and in different places where she says, talking about justice and piety will make the world more pious and more just. And I think that is Arendt's answer. You know, I'm using that in a somewhat sense, but which is to say that the more people who agree with Trump and disagree with Trump, to use the example on the table, talk to each other, the more they will find things they agree on. And those things they agree on will be the building blocks of a potential new common world that they can share together. Um, and I think that's true. I mean, I think it's over and over again shown that if you take two people who seem like idiots, one on the left and one on the right, and they yell and scream, and you put them in a room with a group of people, and you tell them to talk to each other, they can find things they agree on, if they're willing to do it. And they can start to respect, find things they respect about each other. Um, and so one thing to think about, because you mentioned algorithms and the internet, is that it's not algorithms per se that are the problem, although there are a problem in many ways, but it's the fact that the algorithms are designed to um, 
uh, direct people to material that is most irritating to them uh, or most uh, that, sh that, that most uh, um, affirms their anger because that's what's been shown to keep them engaged the longest and thus see the most ads and be the most profitable. You could design algorithms uh, to show people things which make them think the most or make them see opposite opinions the most or, um, or, or provide them with those videos or, or, or tweets or Facebook posts or whatever that have been shown to make people um, uh, actually stop tweeting and Facebooking for a little bit and think. Those are potential algorithms that we could develop, but we don't use those because they're not profitable. Um, uh, you know, there's a, I don't know how many of you have looked at um, uh, Taiwan, but Taiwan has an office of digital something, digital whatever. And the woman who runs it, uh, that's her job is to actually use the internet um, to uh, direct people towards opinions that are um, the most thought provoking and the ones that people have found the most interesting and useful on a wide range outside of any one political viewpoint. And that they are using algorithms and forks and other things in Taiwan to actually um, use the internet to deepen debate, not to polarize it. Um, I don't, you know, I haven't, I'm just looking at it right now. I haven't studied it that deeply. If anyone knows a lot about this Taiwanese project, I'd love to learn more about it. Um, but uh, it does strike me that there are ways that you could, you know, rethink and rejigger social media or the internet to, to do these things, but it's probably not going to be as profitable. And um, one has to decide if, if we can, if we can marshal the, the will to do that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think the overarching answer to your question is that the way to, um, in a polarized world of plural people, the way to build common, cons common foundations is to actually talk to each other. And that's something that we don't do. So, um, uh, yeah, that's my, <laughs> is that, and that's, that was your question, right? I think, or your point. Yep, that was, that was the question. Cause it does seem like, you know, we are in, we, it, it's hard to become impartial if we're in this self-confirming world and we don't have exposure to diverse opinions that could enhance and improve our judgment. Yeah. There are many ways to do this, Monica. And like, so, you know, I think many of you know that the RN Center has become more and more involved in something called the citizen assembly movement, something where we've been, we had a conference on it last year. We're, we're going to have, we're, we have, a, we've been doing a number of programs on it and, you know, just to get, you know, here's an interesting, you know, one group of people who've proposed, who've, who've been proponents of citizen assemblies have argued that if you bring random selectively people and you put them in a room and you, whatever, they'll make better decisions, better judgments, right? I'm not saying it won't happen, but I don't actually believe that. You know, maybe it will. You know, the argument that I take from Hannah Arendt to support citizen assemblies is that you put randomly selected people in a room having to make judgments. It's not that they'll make the right judgment, but they will find shared understandings that will change them and change the foundations of our common world. And that's the uh, advantage to me of citizen assemblies. It's the same argument Alexis de Tocqueville made for juries when he said that the jury was the most important institution of American democracy. Because it's not that juries make the right judgments, but it's that in bringing people together to have to make judgments, people learn to talk to one another and make judgments about right and wrong with fellow citizens who they might otherwise disagree with. And that teaches them what does it mean to be part of a pluralistic democracy. Um, and so I, I take citizen assemblies to be citizen juries, randomly selected people not to make legal judgments, but to make political judgments. And that's why um, I've 
been steering the RN Center into this world of 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 citizen assemblies because I think it's a very Arendtian uh, uh, approach to the problem. Okay. Excellent. Um, Vigdis. Uh, yes, I'm bit on uh, how um, uh, Arendt, um, when she talks about this distinction between acting, or Kant talks about the distinction between acting and the spectator and the actors. And I think it's also related, at least as I understand it, and that will be a bit of my question, uh, because this has to do with the difference between right and wrong. And as she ends the first session with this, the, but the question when she introduces judgment and taste, and then she, she wrote, writes that, but the question of right and wrong is to be decided by neither taste nor judgment, but by reason alone. And then she goes on in another place in page 15, she says, for judgment of the particular, this is beautiful, this is ugly, this is right, this is wrong, has no place in Kant's moral philosophy. And to me, this makes sense uh, when you see what she writes in uh, page 19, what can I know, the three basic questions of Kant, what can I know? what ought I to do, and what may I hope. So, uh -huh. and his, because his, his moral philosophy, his practical reason, which Arendt is not so interested in, in my view, because she has his, when he discovered reason, as she says, that is, he discovered thinking in her view. But in Kant's practical reason, that is the moral law, and it's related to the moral law, and it's, to follow the moral law, and that is his concept of the will as well. That's why the cons concept of the will wasn't interesting to, to Arendt, as I see it, because it's not a free will, it's a will that follows this practical law. And by that, he, he a kind of, to act has to be to act in accordance with the moral law in Kant. And that's why when you come to judgment and what you may hope for with the human kind, because it's very, very clear that people are not saints around. We are actually both intelligent and sensible creatures. And that's, I think, has to do with why we have to judge as spectators. And this is something quite different, but that is also why he feels this, uh, <laughs> why he seems to say that the actors he despises him, what the people's action in the revolution or what are in course the coup d'etat, because uh, that's not moral acting. And to him, it is something, does that make sense? And it's also interesting I find when Aaron says on page 19, and I think she might be right there, uh, she says in in a quotation or in what you call it this she says word. in the middle on the page on the contrary we shall see that the way Kant phrased the question and also it will be in a way and probably was in Kant's own way too when he tried to reconcile his political insights with his moral philosophy and when we tried to suggest that Kant's political philosophy would have been like had he found time and strength to express it adequately. I think to me that's quite important how, cause, and it also says something, what I find, what I like with this moral philosophy is that when he says that uh, in practical reason, what's matter is the intention, what the intention for, that you act according to the moral law. And that's the intention behind the act. And that has to be in accordance, in accordance with the moral law. And that means also that when we judge other people, we can never say anything about their intention. That is not, we can't know anything about it. We can see what they are doing. We can judge the acts, but never say anything about the intention about it. And that's, that to me is a quite interesting division. And I haven't, feeling of what Orant is actually 
taking something from that because she takes something from Kant, but not all. So I don't, I know, does this, this make sense to you? <laughs> well, thanks, Vignes. I, I think that, um, I mean, you're bringing up a lot of big issues and I'm not sure I figured out all the connections between them, but, uh, you know, it is important uh, to, to, you know, to remind ourselves that, um, that Kant's moral philosophy is a practical philosophy, right? And as a practical philosophy, it's a philosophy of action, um, uh, not of judgment, right? Um, and as a result, as you, as you rightly put it, um, judgment is not practical reason. Practical reason reasons and tells me what to do and what not to do. It lays down the law and is identical with the will. Um, uh, that said, uh, the origin of practical, um, of, of the categorical imperative in Kant's practical philosophy is uh, a feeling, right? Uh, the feeling of awe before the law, the Achtung vor dem Gesetz. And uh, as such, um, you know, you can say it reasons, it does, but it, what actually is the source of the command to obey that reason is a feeling. And as a feeling, um, uh, it's an aesthetics and thus a judgment. And, and so I, I, I think, uh, so let me just say, this is a very strong Arendtian reading of Kant uh, that I'm doing here. It's also a Heideggerian reading of Kant. Um, but I think that Kant's practical philosophy is itself um, uh, deeply caught up in his aesthetic philosophy. Um, um, uh, but they, there's also ways in which, as you're pointing out, they, they need to be kept apart. I mean, she brings this up again near the end of what we read today in, in section, in lecture uh, 11, where at the bottom of 67, she says judgment and especially judgments of taste always reflects upon others and their taste takes their possible judgments into account. This is necessary because I am human and cannot live outside the company of men. I judge as a member of this community and not as a member of a super sensible world, perhaps inhabited with beings endowed with reason, but not with the same sense apparatus. As such, I obey a law given to myself, regardless of what others may think of the matter. Now that's the, that's the categorical imperative, I think. I mean, um, uh, this law is self-evident and compelling in and by itself. The basic other directness of judgment and taste seems to stand in the greatest possible opposition to the very nature, the absolute idiosyncratic nature of the sense itself. So it's that there's a... I mean, she's talking, I mean, she's basically saying that insofar as I make judgments of subjective taste, it seems to stand in opposition to the fact that in my subjective of my, my judgment of subjective taste, I am giving a law to myself, whether that's the moral law and practical reason, or whether that's the, uh, um, the census communis here. Um, yeah, I think it's the census communis. I think that's the plurality she talks about. That's, I th to me, it's where she differs from Kant. Well, Kant if Kant had a problem with that, because I think Habermas is much more aligned with Kant in this than Arendt was. And Arendt respects the plurality, plurality. And that's why there is no right judgment in so. But when you said that we have to talk and we have to to reason with people, the same argument as for having this uh, citizen assemblies. It is for people to meet and to talk, to make judgment based on that you have gone visiting to more people, so to say. But I don't think Owen thinks that we have this kind of moral law in the same way as, as Kant 
beliefs. At least that's my view on it. And I think she's more aware of us being human beings on the earth with senses living in the parent world. Mm, okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I will leave it. You're you having the last word there. I, I'm uh, not having much more to say to that, but thank you. I'd have to, I'd have to think about it more. Um, we're, we're close to time. So let me just bring in one more question and let Dina ask her question. And then we'll, unfortunately, um, there's a bunch of other questions and I apologize, but uh, Dina, go ahead. I wanted to uh, go back to the relationship between thinking and judgment. And uh, on the one hand, Arendt is critical of the tradition that involves the thinker who is moved away uh, Uh, that is outside of the world and 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 beyond opinion. Um, but I was wondering what what according to how Arendt has made that so persistent, that attempt so seductive. Why, for much of the history of Western thought, has that approach won the day? And then relatedly, well, which which approach, Dina? Because you cut out for a little bit. Oh, I'm huh? sorry. The approach of the thinker who has removed themselves from the world. Who, uh, who believe themselves to be beyond opinion. And then relatedly, elsewhere, Arendt will say that thinking, uh, reason is all about meaning, um, not knowledge, not understanding, not the production of, of, of knowledge, but meaning. And I was wondering if there is, can there on the Arendt's uh, conception, can there be thinking that creates meaning? So, um, Dina, your 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 bunt your your internet or either your or my internet is cutting out every once in a while. Um, but you know, on the question, the first question of of why um, we hold on to this idea of the thinker and maybe the judge as um, impartial or out of the world. Um, you know, in Life of the Mind, she talks about how there are these authentic semblances and the thinker as someone who's separated from the world is clearly a semblance. It's not real. And yet there's something authentic about it that um, makes it real in our, in our world. And, and I think that, um, and as for the judge, um, you know, again, there is no judge who's out of this world. Everyone is embodied and cultured and of a class and a race and a nationality. Uh, and yet we, we, we preserve this idea or this authentic semblance of the judge who jumps out of time in the Hegelian sense and can sort of be a, a, a an impartial judge of the world. Um, because uh, it conforms with our idea of justice, uh, of being, uh, imp you know, being uh, um, disinterested and impartial. And if we, you know, I mean, we, we, I mean, there's nothing easier to do than to criticize a judge and say, well, actually, you know, they're of a certain class or a certain race or a certain gender, they have partiality, you know, and that, and yet, by holding on to this ideal, we hope that the judge will, to the greatest extent possible, um, put aside their self-interest, right? You know, the Supreme Court today is seen as a bunch of partisan political hacks. Uh, and there's a debate amongst many legal scholars about whether we should even continue to think about the Supreme Court as a legal court, or just imagine it purely as a small group of people doing politics and under the uh, deceptiveness of law. And, um, you know, I think this is the kind of questions that this that your question raises is, should we hold on to these authentic semblances, admit their semblances and yet argue that there's something meaningful about them? Or should we simply uh, 
abandon them to ideology critique and say that they're just ideologies. Um, uh, as for as for this, you know, as for Kant on this level and Arendt, um, I mean, the argument is that actually judgment is something that has to make this claim. Uh, clearly, often it doesn't, and often it's prejudiced, and often it's partial. Um, but 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 that's her claim, and um, I, I, you cut out a little bit. I'm not sure if I'm if I'm getting to the heart of your question, but maybe I am. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I do realize there's a bunch of other questions today, but I, I we're out of time and I need to run. So I apologize, but we will continue. Does anyone know if we did look at the schedule? Are we meeting next week or no? Or it's in no, two it's weeks. Easter. Yeah, it's Passover and Easter next week. So it's two weeks from now. We'll continue with the last two lectures, um, 12 and 13. They're really the meat of the matter. So enjoy reading them. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Happy Passover. Happy Easter. Happy Ramadan. Anything else I'm missing? Uh, enjoy your next two weeks and I'll see you uh, in two weeks to read Hannah Arendt. Thanks very much. Thank you.